welcome to Legal Connections. Today is President's Corner, as we'll feature a conversation with FAMU President Dr. Larry Robinson. I'm Keith Miles, the Interim Director of Communications at FAMU. And Dr. Robinson, there are so many great things happening at Florida A&M University, or as you like to say, there's something great happening every day at FAMU. And uh, let's start off by talking about a major gift that the university received from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation recently. Well, thanks, Keith. It's my pleasure to be back on the show. And that's just one of, one of, uh, of many indications of great things happening every day at FAMU. The Bill and Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation recently donated $1.5 million to the university to allow us to really stand up our own COVID-19 testing laboratory. As you know, Thermo Fisher is providing the laboratory equipment and the test. However, the, the unmet need was the personnel need. So that $1.5 million spread out over three years would allow us to hire the staff needed to operate that lab on a daily basis. And so the whole concept was part of what Thermo Fisher calls the Just Project, mm -hmm. project where you know there's a hub institution, an HBCU, and we are pleased to be that. And we provide testing services for our own faculty, students, and, and staff, but also to uh, a, another suite of HBCUs. And for FAMU, those are the three private historically black colleges and universities in the state of Florida. So we're looking really, you know, with a lot of in, you know, enthusiasm towards this partnership. So many thanks to the Gates Foundation. Yeah, part of that partnership, you mentioned Thermo Fisher. Of course, a FAMU alumnus has a, a big part, a big role in developing that partnership, and that is Michael DuBose. So once again, FAMU alumni are everywhere and contributing in all kinds of ways. And this is very important to acknowledge that because, um, you know, although FAMU has a great, you know, a reputation with regard to pharmacy and our allied health program, mm -hmm. the Institute of Public Health, Mike DuBose is the vice president, mm -hmm. you know, at Thermo Fisher Healthcare, right? And, and he saw it appropriate that his alma mater be included, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, uh, the inclusion of FAMU in this will, will it actually make the project that much more effective. But I do want to give a shout out to our alums. There's so many ways you can give back to FAMU. You can write the big check like you do, Keith, <laughs> and so many others. Or you can make sure that when there are opportunities available to take advantage of the you know, resources we have to help our students, help our faculty, and our staff, you step in on those occasions as well. Since April 25th, uh, the university have, has had its own COVID testing site uh, housed at Bragg Memorial Stadium. Mm -hmm. And proud to say, uh, nearly 60,000 people have been tested. Uh, how will all of that happening with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Thermo Fisher now enhance what's already been going on? Right, yeah, so we're really proud of the fact that we have stood up in partnership with the state of Florida Department of Health, the Division of Emergency Management, and Bond Community Health Clinic mm -hmm. right here on the south side of town. Mm -hmm. You know, really really the first in this region uh, community-based testing site that didn't require physician's referral, you didn't have to be symptomatic, you could walk up, you could drive up, but it is free mm -hmm. to any and all in a place where it's most desperately needed. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been a partnership. It's available to the entire community. Mm -hmm. What the new initiative allows us is to focus more directly on, mm -hmm. you know, FAMU mm -hmm. internal needs and those of our colleague uh, HBCUs in the state. Mm -hmm. So we can design our testing programs to accommodate, you know, athletic programs, you know, teaching, and other services that we provide to our students and our, and our faculty and visitors to, to the campus. So it's really, really important, too, that we can actually use this site to help train, you mm -hmm. know, students and others in the ins and outs of this very, very important, you know, activity for the betterment of our students. And by the way, I should point out that under the leadership of Ms. Tanya Tatum, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Cynthia Harris, you know, from the Institute of Public Health, um, you know, we, we, um, we, we've had several of our students and faculty in public health who've who, um, been serving as contact tracers for the Department of Health and Emergency Management throughout the pandemic, right? Now we get to train some of the students in some of the actual testing mm -hmm. and, and some of those very, very important steps that are important as well in their development. 
Speaking of um, the Department of Health, uh, another alum, alumna, uh, Dr. Shamario Robertson. Mm -hmm. Robertson is very involved and has been very involved with the COVID testing site. And once again, it's important to point out, you can write the big checks like Keith Bow <laughs> does. We appreciate those. But Shamario Robertson, a graduate of our Institute yes. of Public Health, was very, very instrumental in helping to ensure that that testing site was right here, mm -hmm. you know, f for the last several months at Bragg Memorial Stadium. So shout out again to the alumni of Florida a &M University. The White House even is involved and yes. uh, has sent uh, uh, equipment, testing kits uh, to the university. Uh, how, what is their involvement with uh, all of this going yeah, on? Yeah, so they have provided um, to HBCU states and other universities around the country significant numbers of antigen tests. These are those 15 minute tests where the results can be known in as little as 15 minutes, right? And so um, they're very, very important because you can direct, you know, very uh, critical testing needs, you know, using this technology. Uh, so we've received 7,000 of those so far. That is certainly not a trivial amount. Mm -hmm. And we, are, we have another batch of 7,000 underway. And so we can target very specific programs, you know, athletics, the development, you know, the development research school and so forth. Although they've gotten their uh, share of tests from the state's allocation mm -hmm. as well, but we have some that came straight to us from federal sources that's very, very important in our, you know, ongoing reopening plans for the university. Speaking of the reopening plans of the university and all that's happened because the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, took everybody off guard, right? And so the, the, uh, the mode of operation for the university had to pivot and change quickly uh, in less than two weeks. And so take us back to the start of the whole pandemic and how the university had to quickly change uh, its, mo op its mode of operation. Yeah, so it's important that people recognize, you know, what has happened in the last six or seven months at Florida and University, but, but other businesses and educational mm -hmm. institutions around the nation. No one is operating in, in the fall of 2020 exactly the way they were operating in the fall of 2019 and mm -hmm. before. So in, in March right, of, of this year, we made a tremendous transformation. Right? It wasn't just a pivot. We transformed mm -hmm. from you know, about 90% of our courses and being offered you know, in person to everything mm -hmm. being offered remotely in really in less than a 10 day period. So I have to give a big shout out to our faculty, the provost, our staff, who all contributed to that remarkable you know, transformation and our students you know, for going with us in that you know, transformation as well. It was very, very important for them because we had to maintain the academic services and other services to, to keep them on track to graduate or you know, in the spring or summer or on whatever that path might be now and in the future. So it was a remarkable transformation. In the meantime, however, what we did in the, the weeks and, and months after that is we actually developed a more timely, you know, comprehensive uh, reopening plan that we are in the midst of right now for uh, the fall semester and making plans for the spring semester. But we had to do a tremendous a number of important things. First, it, you know, the lack of availability of technology for students and faculty and staff was a major challenge, but people stepped up, they made contributions. You know, we trained hundreds of faculty in this new mode of delivery, mm -hmm. right? And, and they stepped up, you know, throughout the fall, I mean, throughout the spring, as well as the summer sessions to get ready for the circumstances right now. And so right now, however, we find ourselves at about 85% or so of our instructional activities being offered virtually. And as you know, we, we have sort of a, um, a, an operation plan for faculty, for staff, mm -hmm. that allows us to take advantage of our telework policies so that we don't, you know, um, inadvertently put anyone in uh, an unnecessary uh, conditions. We're adhering strictly to CDC guidelines when it comes to social distancing and so forth. So a number of our offices, you know, they have interesting rotations of personnel, the number of people in offices is 
limited, but the one thing that we are committed to doing and we are actually doing is making sure that our students have access to the services that they need either virtually or in person. Um, one of the things that we've done in, in order to communicate everything that was going on to all of our stakeholders is uh, utilize uh, this whole new concept of Zoom and virtual meetings and we even had have had virtual commencements. Yes. So uh, how has all of that gone? Yeah, so we've had, I think, uh, my God, so many virtual town hall meetings, <laughs> I, it's hard to keep up with, but they were very, very important, right? right? Uh, we just had one earlier this week uh, for students about how we are closing out the fall semester and the plans for the spring semester. And then on Thursday evening at 4 p.m. or afternoon at 4 p.m., we'll have another uh, town hall for faculty and staff. So this virtual environment has been critical, right, for not only operating in terms of you know, educational delivery and services to students, but in terms of communication, mm -hmm. right? So it's one thing to send out a flyer, you know, on family info over the internet. It's another thing to have an opportunity for people to submit questions and hear from us live, you know, real time, as to the things and steps that we're taking to address their, their needs. Furthermore, as you know, um, although the audiences are primarily engaged through Zoom, you know, we broadcast to a much broader audience, you know, on Facebook and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then your shop posts all of those sessions on the web page for others to see yeah. when, when, that, when, the, uh, time, when they have the available time to do so. Um, um, the um, government, uh, the CARES Act mm -hmm. has uh, stepped in and helped um, us to make a lot of adjustments in terms of changing our whole concept of operation. How, uh, how have those funds been used? And uh, one of the things you like to say is it, it's been great, but it is not the whole picture. Yeah, so we, um, we are very fortunate in our students mm -hmm or as well to be the recipients of CARES Act monies to this point. And I want to appreciate everyone, you know, in Washington, D.C. who contributed to make it this possible. And I want to encourage them to, to, to get on with this next round because, you know, our, our needs uh, are still significant, right? Mm -hmm. But I do want to say that those funds, you know, have some of them have been prescribed in terms of what we could do. The first allocation, we, we had to get back to students so we develop a strategy around sort of a need-based component to it and so we distributed over six million dollars to students you know back in the early part of the spring mm -hmm. late part of the spring early part of the summer small amount of that still lasts for you know special circumstances and then of course there was another six and a half million that we were able to use to to you know sort of make up for the losses in revenue that occurred as a result of you know canceling food services and housing and so forth for students and other sources of revenue. And then we have another, you know, uh, CARES Act fund that we're using for current operations. You know, things such as um, disinfectants, mm -hmm. um, you know, plexiglass shields, masks, tremendously e expensive, you know, to operate in this environment and still you know, to make up for revenue losses because, you know, we're down to less than 50% of the students' capacity in our dormitories, meal plans are down, and, and so forth. And we've even experienced about a 4 to 5% enrollment decline. And so these funds are very, very important to allow us to, you know, make up uh, for those losses as well. But as you said, Keith, as appreciative as we are, and we really are, of these CARES Act monies, they do not make us whole. We don't want anyone to stop giving. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, this is probably one of the most critical times in our history to give because the impacts of COVID-19 on our students and their families are going to go far beyond the fall semester of 2020, the spring semester of 2020. We know there are millions of people out of work. And we know that the demographic that we serve is the group them and their families most disadvantaged by unemployment and it's going to very likely be that they'll be they'll take the longest mm -hmm. uh, to recuperate and so you know things like as you know SOS save our students program the alumni 
you know, has, has championed over the last uh, few years are critical now, you know, keeping students in, in, you know, in school. I do want to commend alumni again for the uh, fundraising effort that they had on our, you know, on our birthday on October the 3rd, where they raised over half a million dollars to support various initiatives at the university. This is the time to give. The need uh, at FAMU is at an all-time high. Our students and our families, are, some of them are suffering significantly, and that pain and suffering is, is not quite over. Yeah, this is a good opportunity to, you know, gives a give a thumbs up to the alumni and all of the supporters who have rallied mm -hmm. to the crime because they, they have been significant too in helping FAMU uh, continue to, to have uh, or st uh, to uh, support student success. Oh yes, and so our corporate partners, mm -hmm. those who are you know in the industry cluster, you know this is the time. You know we had a great session um, I guess earlier this month, right, where we had um, one of our great alums, John Thompson, mm -hmm. who we had a conversation with, and Cheryl Harris, you know, who chairs the mm -hmm. FAMU industry cluster, uh, talking about how FAMU play, made a difference in his life, you know. Last week we had the, um, the president, you know, of, of perhaps, you know, one of the most innovative sort of online um, entertainment industries, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, speak with our students in the uh, uh, SBI mm -hmm. uh, program, uh, the president of, of Netflix. Mm -hmm. They've made tremendous contributions to uh, the HBCU communities uh, around the world, I mean, in the nation, and there are a lot of other companies that I must say are stepping up as well. The question is, will this be sustained, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the issues around social justice that many of them are, are stepping up to address to show that they're in the right place. Those issues aren't gonna be resolved overnight either. And it's gonna take, you know, a long-term commitment to solving those kinds of problems for the nation. Speaking of social justice uh, and alumni of FAMU, um, uh, we are not absent from uh, that aspect of life as well. I mean, we've had several of our alumni who have uh, stepped up and are, are leading uh, the charges uh, on, on those fronts, right? And so um, once again, FAMU is uh, uh, continuing its legacy of being involved in social reform is uh, a, a major player again. Yeah, it's, it's been throughout our history, mm -hmm. right? From from October the third, eighteen eighty seven, mm -hmm. till now. Uh, you know, perhaps there have been some peaks during mm -hmm. that history, like the nineteen sixties, the bus boycott, and so forth. But throughout our history, FAMU students and alums have been actively engaged in such social justice initiatives, and I can't say enough uh, about Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms of Atlanta, Melvin Carter of St. Paul, Minnesota, for being on the front line on the behalf of their communities each and every day on this issue uh, in their communities, but, but also serving as role models for others. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the alumni, but, but actually our students, right, right mm -hmm. here and now, you know, uh, the present SGA president, <clears throat> of Xavier McClinton and his team, they've been out, you know, dealing with this issue, you know, our football players and coaches have marched on the behalf of uh, social, social justice right here in Tallahassee. So it's always been part, you know, of our DNA. And I'm really impressed to see our folks stand up and do it the right way, you know, in a nonviolent, non-confrontational manner, just making sure that everybody understands that, you know, we're not quite right yet, you know, as a, as a community, as a nation, there's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our success will help determine the overall success of this community and the nation. Uh, the mm -hmm. rise of the uh, recognition mm -hmm. of HBCUs and the role that they play in terms of uh, uh, economic development and the impact of our students who are our products who go on to become successful um, in society has also been on the focal point. You have been on a number of uh, uh, Zoom meetings or WebEx calls with uh, HBCU presidents from around the country talking about, you know, what 
uh, our contributions are to the larger society. Right, from, from social justice to research around health disparities, mm -hmm. right? You know, our communities, our institution have had tremendous impacts on our community. Right here at Florida M University, we had one of our best years ever in uh, sponsored research, mm -hmm. generating over $60 million, right? That, that money supports faculty and students who are solving, you know, these very complex problems that confront our nation. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the funds are federal funds to support money issues that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration thinks are important, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, you know, premier institutions who don't give money away. It's a very mm -hmm. competitive process. So that's, so that's a test to the quality of the faculty that we have as well as our students to procure those types of monies. And then, of course, as you know, too, on top of that, we had a a record year in the number of patents that our faculty mm -hmm. received this year as well. And those will translate into other forms of economic development as well. You know, I, I, I had a you know, I had a a call earlier today and, and I was talking about, you know, some of the unique economic development impacts that we, we are having, you know, the solar farm that we're mm -hmm. developing you know, down at our Brooksville site is one of those. The medical marijuana, me medical marijuana educational research initiative where we are actually serving as a key agent for the state and, you know, approving, you know, seeds for that industry that's, that's growing around yeah. the state yeah. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, this was also a great year for FAMU in terms of funding from performance-based funding. I mean, yes. how the university has r risen up to new standards and um, been successful. Yeah, so it's really an attestment once again, you know, when you think about the quality of our faculty, staff, and the plans, right, mm -hmm. that have been developed, you know, in partnership with our board of trustees that have allowed, allowed us to raise the bar, so to speak, you know, increasing graduation rates, retention rates, mm -hmm. uh, all of those are key factors, the employment of students, you know, gainful employment of students, you know, students who are going on to post baccalaureate experiences, all of those are key metrics that, that are used to determine, you know, funds that will be awarded in the performance funding model. And so for the past two years, consecutively, FAMU has received um, over $13 million each uh, because of our performance in, in that model. And we plowed those monies right back into those student success initiatives that got us there in the first place, and we're going to continue to do that because it's very, very important, mm -hmm. you know, that, that our students leave us, you know, as, as soon as possible because that, that contributes to them having as less debt mm -hmm. as possible. And then they can get on into the world and start making, you know, their impacts. So they're becoming the John Thompsons and the Will Packers, you know, and the Keisha Lance, Keisha Lance Bottoms, you know, uh, of tomorrow. You know, and, and they leave here unencumbered by, you know, excessive debt. When you talk about um, um, increasing uh, our, our performance in terms of producing quality students, um, we've got two new deans. Mm -hmm. uh, new dean at the College of Law, since we were on Legal Connections, and then mm -hmm. also a new dean in the, in the School of Nursing. Yes. And I know you have high expectations for them. Well, both of these, um, you know, young ladies have hit the ground running, and, and I have nothing but high expectations based upon not only their track record, mm -hmm. but, but what they've done in the relatively short time that they've been here. They've been able to marshal the troops, so to speak, and get everybody aligned and focus on those key issues that are going to be necessary for those institutions to be mm -hmm. great. You know, we had the first bachelor's of nursing program in the state of Florida, mm -hmm. right? I mean, over 80 years. We had a big celebration here a few years ago, and to see those alums come back and celebrate that with us, it's a special meeting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had the right people in that program. You also know the struggle we had with reestablishing the law school, mm -hmm. which was taken from us, right? Uh, some time ago, back in the, the Jim Crow era, we have it back now. We owe everybody who played a role in making that happen, and every student there now who is aspiring to be a lawyer, 
and work on the behalf of underrepresented populations or whether they want to go into the corporate sector or the world, we owe it to them to make sure that that program you know, provides them that opportunity. I think we have the right leadership there and I, I commend the provost and his team for, for you know, bringing those two persons to the FAMU family. Blueprint Intergovernmental Agency, which is a, a local uh, governmental agency, recently uh, committed $10 million to um, Bragg Memorial Stadium. We think of Bragg Memorial Stadium as the place where the Rattlers play, but it's far more oh, yeah. important than a football stadium. It is. And uh, we've seen how important it is with the COVID-19 testing site. Uh, and this is just one example. Mm -hmm. It is a treasured uh, community resource. How important was that investment mm -hmm. into the stadium? So first I wanna thank um, the members of the uh, Blueprint Intergovernmental uh, Committee that you know voted to provide that $10 million investment in the South Side, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna not only be beneficial to FAMU and Bragg Stadium, but mm -hmm. to the South Side. You know, I tell people, just imagine a FAMU football weekend with, without all the other things that happen around us that, mm -hmm. that generate, you know, economic development. Think about a FAMU uh, football weekend without Parish Street, yeah, right? Nice. <laughs> it's one example, yeah. but my point is, that is an investment, mm -hmm, Keith, and, mm -hmm. and we are very, very appreciative. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about the economic piece, it's a cultural icon as well. I mean, that, that sacred ground is where the likes of Jake Gaither and so, mm -hmm. and others, Bob Hayes, Bob Hayes yeah. you know, played, right? And, and people chased after Ken, him. Ken Riley. Ken Riley, Ken right? Riley. Who I had an opportunity to go, you know, to his, his funeral this past summer. I mean, just some great, you know, uh, you know, icons of our past, and now you have you know, Willis Simmons and his team, mm -hmm. right? Going, going undefeated, you know, uh, in Bragg Stadium. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just amazing, you know. Uh, but then you have performances by the Marching 100. Mm -hmm. You have the um, uh, K through 12 events, you know, with the Developmental Research School playing their games there. You had a drive-in movie. Yeah, we had a drive-in <laughs> movie there. We, we've done so much there that, uh, you know, we know it's yeah. more than just a, a yeah. football stadium. It's yeah. a cultural asset, an economic driver here on the south side of Tallahassee. Uh, before we have to wrap up, I want to talk about um, Cosmopolitan Magazine. Out of nowhere, Dr. Robinson selected FAMU as the 25th most beautiful campus of colleges all over the United States, and you gotta be extremely pleased with that. And then you just added the brand new, probably a state-of-the-art uh, residence hall on mm -hmm. campus in FAMU Towers. So those kinds of things certainly mm -hmm. enhance the brand. Yeah, you know, to be in that company, that's good company, right? Uh, and sometimes we take, you know, things for granted. You know, when we, some people, walk around and look at Lee Hall, they see an old building. There are others who look, they see an iconic structure, mm -hmm. right, with, with a history, mm -hmm. right, that goes back generations. And here it is, still standing and serving, mm -hmm. you know, in a very critical way for this campus and this community, right? Uh, and then to, to, to add to that, we have probably one of the most prolific periods of construction in our recent history, mm -hmm. right? We have the you know, the new uh, FAMU Tower, 700 mm -hmm. bed dormitory complex, state of the art and everywhere imaginable. We have an 85,000 square foot uh, student uh, center that would allow us to uh, consolidate all of the student services from financial aid to mental health counseling into one place. You know, we have an amphitheater, right? Mm -hmm. That we're about to put the, the top on, so to speak, that would allow us to expand the footprint of the set. And for those of you mm -hmm. who don't know what the set is, you gotta go and look that up on Wikipedia somewhere. I don't have the time. But really the set is a is a place where students gather, mm -hmm. you know, for entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and entertainment and fun, right? I remember um, last year walking past the set first weekend and I saw a young lady with a t-shirt that said, 
And that's on Larry, right? <laughs> <laughs> what in the world is that? She had to explain it to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I bought a couple of those. I posed with her, took pictures, and, and she sold out, right? She had an online, you know, um, uh, store. But, but you know, it, it, the, now that we have the amphitheater, you know, we can spread that out, right? We, we have room uh, to do that. And, um, uh, and that primarily done with student money. Now, we do have a major donor mm -hmm. who wants to remain anonymous at this time, and we will keep that until <laughs> the appropriate big reveal. But, but uh, that's another major asset to the campus culture, having that available for our students as well. So it's been a great year in terms of recognitions for mm -hmm. Ford and m University. You know, we received a, a distinction as one of the few institutions recognized in terms of assessment of student learning outcomes and so forth. So we, it's been a great year for Florida and m University. Whenever we have these opportunities to have these kinds of conversations as time goes so fast. Mm -hmm. But uh, for all of our viewers who have been tuning in today, that's on Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just want to say thank you, Dr. Robinson, for mm -hmm. all that you're doing and all of the great work that's going on at FAMU and for Legal Connections and the President's Corner. Um, uh, this is Keith Miles and saying uh, so long. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye, everybody.